Hello everyone, welcome to the Desolation Sounds podcast. My name is Stephen Hook and this is a podcast celebrating everything to do within the world of alternative music, be that rock, punk, metal or extreme metal. Coming up on this week's show, round up of the news, so we've got student updates from Rise Against and the Black Dahlia Murder, we've got new music from Alexis on Fire, The Highs and, for me, a very eagerly anticipated collaboration between Poppy and Fever 333. New album announcements come from Opeth, The Mighty Slipknot, and there's more details on the Pigeon Conjurer collaboration album. Album reviews this week go to Blood Command, Grand Magus, Kevin Nichols, and The Damn Things, and The Open Mic. We're still staying in a world that's not anything like I just talked about. We're looking at Endless, the debut album from Ali Reza. So, as ever, before we get to any of that, news, and it's kind of kind of small on the ground. Um, just a couple of studio out there. Uh, updates updates both rise against and the black dahlia murder are currently writing for what's conveniently for both of them going to be album number nine uh rise against if their current trajectory of an album every three year continues that should be with us by 2020 um black dahlia murder they've just finished their tour with Meshuggah and a couple of festival dates and they often go for every two years um with nightbring is coming out in 2017 so we might have that by the end of the year it'll be ambitious but you never know they've just said they're right and don't know how far into the right they are i didn't ask i'm sorry there's new music out as well first of all we're gonna start with alexis on fire i think they're the most recent one uh the new song is complicit and it sounds exactly like everything you'd ever want from an alexis on fire song uh i wasn't keen at first it is slowly growing on me and a lot of that came to the fact that before I was listening to it on phone or I had one headphone in just to like casually listen to it. The song weirdly requires both, like I have studio production and all that, my gubbins and just losing stuff in the sound. It, headphones make a huge impact on how you take that song in. Uh, there's no, so this um, follows on from Familiar Drugs. There is no album announced as of yet, but... Considering they've got two new songs out, I'll be quite surprised if there wasn't a new Alexis album on the horizon. Uh, next is just a f- absolute batshit collaboration. Poppy, who, for those aren't aware, was a YouTube personality, a very like avant-garde, I think is the best way to describe her, YouTube personality that blended music and vlogging and just general chit-chat. Um, her music initially was very... Electro pop. Her latest album, I think it's just called X, um, did have some like new metal and some industrial metal stuff in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Her latest song, she's teamed up with the Jason Allen Butler fronted supergroup FIFA 333. I'm apparently dying. <coughs> the song is called Scary Mask, and I'm pretty sure that is the West's equivalent of baby metal. And I think it's fucking incredible. I adore this song. It's so daft and so just weird. And I'm all about it. Um, you, it blends Poppy's ultra idyllic cleans and like manic synths that she's uh, slowly getting known for with uh, Fever 333's brand of just explosive hardcore. It's mad. It's absolutely mad. It's so fucking bonkers and... It's like I said, it's like a West version of Baby Metal. So if you like that very, I was going to say pop orientated metal, not in this, it is in the same way of Baby Metal, but not, say, Amaranth, if you're familiar with them. So it's a bit of a niche, but I, like I said, I absolutely adore it. Um, I wish more collaborations like this happen. Like you get a. A pop star collaborating with doesn't necessarily always have to be a hardcore act, although that would be fucking mental. Um, but yeah, just more of this. Like I think I said about it before, how there's so much community and collaboration in hip hop, and there very rarely is in metal. But quite often, when there's like pop or hip hop collaborating with metal or punk, it usually ends up quite good. Um, and yeah, I would love for this sort of thing. I've always wanted Charlie XCX to do a full-on punk or pop-punk album because, oh, what was that? Was it Sucker? That album she did a few years ago it was fucking great. And it's one of the best 
like borderline pop punk albums of that year. Um, but yeah, that's Poppy featuring 333. The song's called Scary Mask. I don't know if that's going to be part of an album yet, but... Oh, man, imagine if it was a whole EP just full of collaborations like that. Oh! Uh, the final song we got as well is The, the Hives. I don't know why I struggle with that. Hives have got a song called I'm Alive. It's their first new song in four years. It is horrendous fun. It's so upbeat and just happy. Um, I love the fact that the guitar, main guitar riff in the song is backed up by a church bell. It's Like I said, it's super upbeat. It gets your energy up. Um, Pele, lead singer, sounds like a million kroner or exchange rate, 83,000 pounds. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's going to lead to an album. They'd be, again, quite scarce on details, but yeah, Hives, eh? If, Hives, maybe not be immediately familiar by their name. They did, I hate to say I told you so, which was like, people say a one hit wonder from a few years ago, but they did Tick Tick Boom, which is great. They did Throw It On Me with Timberland. Um, I found out a couple of years ago they did the song Come On which is only like a 50 second intro to that um, album I think Lex Hives and that was used for a bunch of adverts as well and no, I, it's one that I don't think many people realise but yeah they're a lot more prominent than people give them credit for and yeah I'm Alive it's a fantastic song new albums for this week well announced in the week, week oh fuck it's been two weeks since I did a proper episode sorry uh, albums have been released announced fuck me since i've been away uh we'll start with opeth because that's easy to say no it's not in calder venom i think i've got that right i nailed that uh in fact in calder venom uh it's coming out later this year there's no this one was quite weird so they gave a track listing the album art and the album name but not when they were releasing it which i thought was quite different usually you get um like a release date with the album title and then you get album art maybe at the same time maybe a little bit later and then usually the last thing is track listing because that's when it when the pre doors all go up but now released everything apart from the release date although it is coming out in 2019 um this is going to be the follow-up to 2016 sorceress and apparently excuse me there's going to be a version released in english and a version released with the lyrics in swedish so i think it'll be uh, a cool little album. I've never really gone in on Opeth. Um, they're more... Their older stuff is more of a greatest hits. Uh, I, God, I can't remember what songs were. You've obviously Blackwater Park and a couple of songs from that. There's a song from... I can just see the album up in my head. It's purple. There, there are... There, as you can tell, Opeth aren't a big thing for me. Something, something prog. But, you know... The fact that they're going quite ambitious and doing both English and Swedish. It might be cool. It might work. It might, I'll be interested to find out if the Swedish one works better with like this, their version of Prog. Um, but yeah, like I said, that's coming out later this year. No, Not much details on it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Condra and Pigeon have released a studio video, like a behind the scenes thing for the upcoming collaboration album, Curse These Metal Hands. That's been given a date. That's coming out the 16th of August. Uh, so far from the little clip of the music in there, it's about 15 minutes long and a lot of it is just various members of Condra and Pigeon dicking around because what else do you do when you're recording an album? Um, so far, I'm not overtly familiar with Pigeon. I missed their album last year, but from what I can tell and what I've looked up since, the little snippets of music in the video lean more toward Pigeon than they do Condra. I really hope I'm pronouncing that right, Pigeon. It looks like that's how it's meant to be pronounced. I'm sorry if it's not. Um, but because there's no concrete music out yet, it's hard. It's it would be unfair to say it's going to sound like pigeon with just conjure chilling in the background. Um, but the one thing that is confirmed, there's tambourines. So none more metal than tambourines. Like I said, the album's called Curse These Metal Hands. It's coming out the sixteenth of August, and yeah, it's a unique collaboration album between Pigeon and Conjure. Usually, those sort of things are just like a split where they have like a couple of songs each. This feels like a full on like borderline super group between the two groups and i'm intrigued they've got you two and green day to to beat that's that's the peak right there. that's the, that's the goal so if pigeon and condra can be as good as you two green day not at all sarcastic at all and the last one the big one from the past couple of weeks slipknot are finally given the last of their details for their upcoming album we are not your kind 
Uh, they So that, that album's coming out the 9th of August. They've also got a new song out, All Out Life. The previous song is not going to be part of the album. Uh, in an interview, Corey Taylor said that it was a fun song that they released and they really enjoyed it. But the story they're trying to tell in We Are Not Your Kind, it just didn't fit the models, which is the fun song that now exists out in the ether. Uh, the lead single for We Are Not Your Kind is called Unsainted. It was uh, accompanied the music. Well, a company music video showed off all the band's new masks, which I'll talk to in a sec. I'll talk about it in a sec, I should say. Um, the song itself, hugely dramatic operatic opening, which just sounded amazing. I love that. Um, the pre-chorus vocal trade between um, I think it was Clown and Corey sounded great. Much more of that, please. The custom percussion continues. Like we, all, I've heard it for years like even at one point i subscribed to this what is the point of all that custom percussioning in slipknot albums uh because yeah just what difference does it make but that just extra metallic clang for like the big snare hits just does add that little bit that extra layer to slipknot sound so they sounded amazing as usual the chorus chorus i said that really weird it felt really weird. The chorus does tread that line between it being a Slipknot chorus and a Stone Sour chorus. I know Slipknot do do the melodic choruses. I'm not disputing that at all. But just I couldn't put my finger on it. it. It was on the line is what I'm trying to say. But I think Jay Weinberg's drumming does like uh, bass drum kicks. They're really erratic and I think that is enough to keep it firmly more towards the Slipknot side of things rather than the Stone Sour kind of things. Um, and yeah, again, similar to the Exodus on Fire song, it's everything you expect from a Slipknot song. The electronics are still quite prominent as well. There was like a breakdown where it was um, Sid and Craig just doing weird shit, which is always, always a good time. The masks themselves look great, apart from Sid, who looks fucking horrifying fucking palpatine looking shithead uh my personal favorite has excuse me i'm still dying uh my personal favorite has to be uh the bassist alessandro venturella who spoke about last week on crocodile what up um he's got i'll describe it as aztec but i'm not willing to commit to that permanently um it's like a weird like from the screen caps, it looks like a weird gold and silver wave design sort of thing. I think it looks really, really cool. Um, and yeah, the other one that really stuck out because you got Mick who looks pretty much the same, Jim who looks pretty much the same, just like a slight tweak. Um, the potential new guy looks like a Burns victim, which is equally terrifying. And Corey's is like the most basic, but I think that's most like ominous because you can. Pretty much see his face, and well, because it's it's opaque, and he's got those like black face paint underneath. So it's his face, but it's all smeary and like coal laden. It's it's odd, but that's what Slipknot go for. It's becoming a thing now where the masks are just a part of the. I was gonna say just part of the image, but like general ethos of Slipknot as much as their music is. So. That's a new Slipknot song and album. We are not your kind. It's coming out the 9th of August. Our reviews then. We're going to start with Blood Command and their fourth EP, Return of the Arsonist. Uh, Blood Command hail from Bergen in Norway. They play a very good, very intelligent version of uh, punk rock. And this technically is the follow-up to 2017's Cult Drugs. Um... I remember finding Blood Command's 2012 album, Funeral Beach, and I found it quite entertaining. I did my usual thing back then of getting a bunch of songs from the album, like three or four, listen to them, saying, oh, this is a good album, or, oh, this is a bad album, and then usually at that point is when I say, I'm going to go look for the whole thing and listen to it. For whatever reason, I just didn't. Uh, I just thought, wow, gee willikers, this is interesting. And I moved on because I'm a fucking idiot. And I did this way too often. I even did it to an extent with cult drugs. That's it. I, <clears throat> excuse me. I remember listening to cult drugs like in full a couple of times. But it was always whilst doing something else. But never really went in proper. It's on my um, 
catch up list, which hopefully I'll get to as part of this show at one point. But yeah, I don't think I'm going to sleep on Blood Command anymore because this EP is fucking brilliant. I cannot stop listening to it. Um, so I've had, what was it? One, two, three, four, five releases over the past week. Um, technically partially over two because the whole Gallows thing last week but each and every time I'm like okay gotta go through Grand Vegas gotta go through Kevin Nichols I would always listen to at least two songs from this first and then go on to whatever I was meant to be doing I am almost angry because I've like glossed over Funeral Beach and Cult Drugs as much as I have I can't sit here and talk about how it fits in with like the Blood Command lore and how it compares to the rest of their back catalogue and give it like a proper sophisticated review other than just going just fuck like it's so good this um from the opening like sci-fi-esque synths on don't strike a match use a lighter to the last rung out note of afraid of water return of the Ar arsonist just keeps you in the zone non-stop it is just I keep, this is what I mean. I didn't want to just go, it's just this, it's just just. I want to have something pure, something worth it, worthy of an album, uh, EP, this good. Um, like, the, you can windmill, windmill? Windmill? Your entire body asunder, or you can put your head through a wall, or you can just have, like, a drunken, impromptu gang chant, karaoke, to any one of these songs. It's just over 10 minutes of some of the funnest music you will ever experience. Uh, the opening two songs of Don't Strike a Match, Use a Lighter, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Season 1, Episode 2, which, honestly, like, as someone who used to be a very naughty boy and pirate things like this, you can't prove it, I'm just saying it for that, well, in case the FBI is listening. Also, don't know why the FBI would be listening to an, uh, an Englishman. To have it set out like this, like the OG piracy um layout is <laughs> weirdly nostalgic and it shouldn't be it really shouldn't be but you know those opening two songs of don't strike a match and season one episode two shows off the versatility of a very intelligent punk band uh such as this like karina sounds so argumentative and in your face throughout don't strike and she's backed up by some straight up barks from ingve and it's spelt Simon, but because it's Norwegian, I want to say Simon, but I'm just going to go with Simon because I'm English and I anglicize everything. Uh, so Ingve and Simon, whereas in season one, episode two, Karina has more of a more battle cry stance, whilst Ingve and Simon this time, I just bring in the trademark uh, pop punk woes all in the background. Uh, the absolute pinnacle highlight masterpiece is Afraid of Water. I'm not sure... If I've gone a day without listening to it, it is that good. Uh, Drummer Sigurd, Drummer? Drummer Sigurd, uh, in those isolated moments on the verses where it's just him and bassist Simon, Simon, his drums almost play it like a war drum. It's just that constant beat in the background. Um, the woes adds a huge community feel that live, that's going to sound amazing. And speaking of amazing, Karina just sounds so bloody brilliant on here. Um, if this was a full album, easily up there as a album of the year contender. Already, it's probably my favorite EP of the year. Uh, Ritual Knife, as a, like a side thing, is just one big breakdown and makes most modern metalcore acts look just inadequate in comparisons. And even though I haven't singled it out, no thank you, I'm into fake hardcore. It's still a great song anyways. I love the name of that. It, like proper OG 2006 post hardcore daft name, but heart fucking damn, this album is well, fucking god damn it. This EP is a hella fun, and like I said, at some point I will go back <clears throat> to cult drugs and give that another bloody good go because it clearly fucking deserves it. If you want to go for this, you'll like it if you are, well, you like it if you like music, but if you want to be specific. Uh, go for it if you're a fan of The Bronx, Marmosets, and Your Demise. I think Your Demise is the one that's a bit more out there, but definitely Marmosets and The Bronx. Uh, the EP is called Return of the Arsonist. They are, it is by, I should say, 
the Norwegian Punk outfit, Blood Command. It is out now. Go and buy it. It's dirt cheap on Bandcamp. That's where I got it. And it's fucking great. Honestly, just so good. On to album number two then. Uh, the album's called Wolf God. It is by Grand Magus, the Stockholm-based epic traditional heavy metal giants. Uh, they hail from... Did I say they hail from Stockholm? I'm going to say it now. They hail from Stockholm in Sweden. It's going to be album number nine. Grand Magus have always been one of those bands that for years, no one's really had a bad thing to say about them. Um, I remember personally first hearing about them around... 2010, 2011, when a I had a copy of Metal Hammer that listed the top 20 albums of pretty much every genre of metal and rock that was going at the time, uh, including like trad metal. Uh, and on there was 2008's Iron Will, which it even listed on there above or like in lieu of hammer of the north which would have come out the same sort of time as that article and similar to, sort of thing to blood command only in like a no pun intended a grander scale my naivety got in a way again um and since then i've kind of kept them as like a greatest hits kind of thing um i kept a couple of songs from iron will and i think there's a one or two from triumph power but I've always been aware, but never really going all the way in when it comes to Grand Magus. Again, bit of a oversight on my part. Early in the year, uh, I, I believe as covered on here, uh, they announced that they would be releasing a new album along with the title track that was released at the time. It was called Wolf God, and initially, I was not very keen on that song at all. To the point where I would go as far as to say I didn't like it. Um, a lot of what I recognise from of Grand Magus was still there, like big chunky riffs, um, the tone to like personify those riffs and just the general pacing of it all. That was all still there, but I was left quite deflated by the vocals of JB, which usually is like the best part of Grand Magus. Sorry, other two members of Grand Magus. Um, because JB is a great vocalist. I'd go as far to say maybe underrated because whenever anyone starts talking about like the greatest vocalist in metal, he's quite often left behind which isn't fair because he's fucking brilliant but one of the things that drew me into uh grand magus is their knack for making jb's vocal lines sound that much more dramatic whether it's him on his own hitting those really big bombastic notes or bassist matt's backing him up to give him a more rounded sound uh grand magus especially on choruses sound fucking huge and grand wolf god just didn't really have that it always sounded quite bored on the chorus dare i say and i based on that i was i was planning just to overlook the album entirely but i thought no given this sort of platform i have now fucking go in what's the worst that could happen and if i'm honest i'm quite glad i did because the title track is the exception the rest of the album does have those big vocal hooks in spades uh, Spear Thrower and Brother of the Storm have are the ones where they've got JB predominantly on his own for the choruses, and then the rest of the album usually has uh, backing vocals or synths to really bring home that drama in the performance. And other reviewers that I've seen of Wolf God um, or just Grand Magus over the years, there's always that comparison between Grand Magus and Manowar, both straddling that line between OG heavy metal and power metal. On this, though, I think the power metal is toned down all but completely. Uh, I think the closest you get is the last two songs of He Sent Them All to Hell and Untamed, which I think is more closer to that 70s, 80s, new way the British heavy metal kind of thing. Um, he Sent Them All to Hell could be Grand Maker's equivalent of You've Got Another Thing Coming by Judas, Judas Priest. Otherwise, they fully embrace like the doomier side of Grand Maker, something that I've always preferred anyways. Um, like looking at the songs that I mentioned a minute ago, so Iron Will, Silver into Steel, Triumph and Power, they always touch on the more, more doomier side of things, I think, anyways. But here we are. It's like even including those last two songs where it does get a bit more um, higher register, 
it's very mid-tempo for like, the entire album. And for me, I didn't mind it. It's one of the rare occasions where I don't mind the, sl uh, the slower tempo. But I can see and I have read a couple of reviews that say the mid tempo -ness is a bit of a grind. I think if this is your first Grand Makers album, like the only way is up. But Grand Makers strike me as a sort, they're sort of like a clutch in a way. Where there's no bad album. There's just a slightly less good one. Um, from again, what I've heard from other people and what I've read about Grand Makers in general, I think this is. A, I I enjoy this album. I think it's a great starting block for anyone who's just getting into this kind of thing. Um, my only suggestion would be those last two songs. Shuffle them in the mix a little bit just to break up because it is fairly mid tempo. Then just like slightly peaks at the at the end. Just dot them around a little bit more on the track list and just to break it up a little bit. I th weird as it sound, I think that might have swung more people around, but I think this is a really consistent album. I did really enjoy it. If you are a fan of like Doomy, classic heavy metal, so your Black Sabbath, your Dio, Candlemas, I think Grand Magus will be something that you would get into. It's like I said, it's very pomp and circumstance. Usually power metal influence doom metal this time it's just all epic well more the long stuff like epic doomy heavy metal and yeah i listened to it yesterday just before i went to work and i put my like loads of viking beards in my beard because that's how you feel uh it's viking as fuck and yeah a lot of fun like i said uh the song song the album is called wolf god it is by grand magus check it out if you are a fan of just having a hairy chest beating on it and drinking ale out of a horn third release for this week then it's the second ep both from the man in question and for this episode uh, it's called long lungs it is by kevin nichols he is a grungy punk from oakland in california and is a i believe is a second ep in a trilogy that nichols describes as documenting kevin nichols reluctant rise to adult responsibility can relate uh, the first EP that describes itself like this is Getting Hard. That came out in September 2018. And at this current time, 90s worship is pretty much in full effect. Uh, Pokemon is back in cinemas with Detective Pikachu. Uh, Blue's Clues is coming back imminently, if not it's back already. Those massive new metal jeans from JNCO might be about to make a comeback. The company just saved itself from liquidation uh, about a month ago. Uh, musically as well, Issues and Off My Men helped usher in a new metal revival. Milk Teeth and Citizen and Bands of That Ilk brought back grunge. And just the other night, my friends went to go watch Spice Girls Live. That's the current musical climate we're in right now. Mr. Nichols, thankfully though, is not following in those footsteps of Spice Girls. He is instead opting to go down the route of 90s grunge. Combining it with a more classic sounding Oakland pop punk kind of thing to bring the listener a rather interesting cross America sound. Um, opening title track, opening to the title track I should say, is it's a dissonant sound and a lot of reverb from like the grungy end of the spectrum with the popular more upbeat vocals from the mainstay California pop punk. Um, it's not too dissimilar to what, like, uh, vocally at least, what Swimmers were doing um, in their album Burkers on Fire earlier this year. But then after that initial opening to Long Long's song, it goes into a very Nirvana-esque monotone crawl, which just breaks in this massive shouting barrage, um, which, like that, like I said, the opening... Um, like pop pop meets grunge things it puts you in one mindset and then this like quite intense it feels like he's like nose to nose with you just spurting all this at you it gets quite intense it gets quite intimidating it's good but it's intimidating uh carry on crow is the fullest the oakland sound comes through that's probably that's the closest the pop punk gets to being the lead genre in this ep or the punk rock i keep saying pop punk it's very not it is more the straight edge punk thing i don't know why i keep saying punk punk probably because it's oakland and i'm an idiot uh layla and easy way out i can pinpoint the milk tea songs that they remind me of uh layla's a fucking great song by the way um 
it's Nirvana as fuck. As much as I've just like compared it to Milk Teeth, there's a lot of Nirvana in this. Um, very much a case of hero worship, and I think it's fun. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. I keep saying fun. I need to get better words, but it's fantastic. There we go. Slightly different word. Um, I'm really intrigued by this concept. I'm not sure if he'll stick to this particular musical idea. Um, I went back and briefly looked at the Getting Hard EP, and there's a lot more garage rock and stoner rock elements in there so at this point it's hard to tell if the music will grow up with the story Nichols is trying to tell or if it's gonna if this is like what he wants to do now um if it's a case of he's elevating the music as he goes along timeline wise that means the next EP will be some unholy alliance of low end punk rock with like a razor light or killers esque indie rock which sounds terrifying um either way this is a musician that sounds like he's got an idea or a vision in his head and one i think i will be keeping an eye on in the future this like blend of uh 90s worship combining it with so far it's like musical ideas that have evolved over time over the course of the 90s i am i am all all down for and yeah i'll be trying to keep an eye out for ep3 when that comes out Whenever that comes up, what's the gap between September and April? It's about seven months. Seven months from April, so that'll be January next year, if the math is right. It's around tail end of the year, start of next year. We might have EP3 from Kevin Nichols, and yeah, we can see what what he's done. Uh, for fans of Nirvana, this is Milk Teeth. I talked about them both uh, before. I'm also going to throw Halls in there as well. I know they're a little bit more noise rock but in general vibe of everything halls milk teeth and nirvana go in for them go in for long lungs of the ep the second ep from california 90s worshiper and all-around dude kevin nichols next up on our album roundup and the last four the usual assortment of albums before the open mic, which isn't old, but still new, but it's not quite the same, but whatever. It is the second album from the supergroup, The Damn Things. The album is called High Crimes. They are based in New York City, or New York State, one of the two. Uh, they play a heavy brand of rock and roll, and it's super fun. And I will talk a lot about Ironoclast in this review, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, the Damn Things, if you are unaware, they it, well, it is comprised of members of... Anthrax, Every Time I Die, Fall Out Boy, and now with the inclusion of Dan Andriano, Alkaline Trio. Um, since I started this podcast, I have spearheaded a The Damn Things reunion, if I do say so myself. Um, and a lot of it was before I ever listened to that debut Damn Things album. When I reviewed it for Open Mic, or whatever it was, a few months back, that was the first time I'd ever probably sat down and listened to the album. I've always pushed the damn thing purely because it meant that Joe and Andy were actually doing something and not just hidden figures in the Patrick and Pete show. Um, after that first album, though, I was fucking hyped for a sequel to Ironic Class. Ironic Class is fucking brilliant. I love that album. It's great. Massive party rock tunes that sound like everyone involved is just having a good time. Uh, with High Crimes... It all started with that lead single, Cells, which got a pretty lukewarm reception. Um, and listening to Ironoclast, I kind of get it, but for every bit as good as the debut is, that shouldn't be taken away from how good or otherwise Cells is, if that makes sense. Basically, what I'm trying to say is, I think if this was album number one, everyone would be going nuts of ourselves. But because of the high standard Ironoclast set, everyone was like, ah, it's a good, but it's not quite that good or um we've got a situation good i didn't really think about that then um but i really enjoyed sales i thought it was a kraken song uh keith sounds phenomenal as always dan is given the opportunity to show off what he can do for the band going forward and that post chorus isolated riff just sounds like someone's playing the blues down a back alley and it sounds great um between that invincible and the song that everyone's been talking about something good those three songs, that three opening songs, is where the peak of the party is. Similar to Ironic Class, where it's like a f opening five song, which was proper upbeat party rock. Um, something good is 
Oh, it's stunning. It's fucking stunning. I love that song. Uh, the cheerleader chants will get stuck in your head all day. Um, there's a crunchy classic rock riff. Um, and it's just superb. And party is where the cowbell is. And the cowbell is all over this song. It's brilliant. It's lovely. I love that song. Invincible. It's, it's good. It's not quite something good, good. But it is just full of indulgence. It teases a dip into glam rock territory. Um, and yeah, this three song salvo or opening salvo of Sell Something Good and Invincible is such a promising start to the album. That doesn't continue for me. And I hate that. I hate the fact that I'm about to shit on an album that I've been wanting to be so good for so long. Um, the rest of the album just sounds way too serious or just forced. Uh, Carry a Brick has this frenetic energy that doesn't really sound like it's going anywhere. It's trying to cram a little bit of personality from every member of the band in, which I don't think works. Uh, Storm Chaser and Keep Crawling are quite doomy and stonery which admittedly they're two genres i don't usually go in for i happily admit that i have just reviewed grand makers as well but for me the only thing that saves them is their choruses uh keep crawling more than storm charmer keep crawling to chorus on that it's just i must admit as much as i'm not a fan of this album keep crawling is a fucking good song or chorus i should say uh, but Let Me Be Your Girl does bring a lot of the icon Ironoclast-esque fun back, but for me, too much of this song, or too much of this album, I should say, and too much of what I like about it is just little bits. Little bits here and there, like the, the chorus of Keep Crawling, those opening three songs. Um, I actually think Let Me Be Your Girl is a little bit too too late in current teams of the album. Um, yeah, it's little bits here and there that I enjoy, and not just like, full the full piece like i did with ironoclast um but for what the damn things is intended to stand for um a sort of like rebellion against everyone's main project i think this is a fine job it sounds nothing like what anyone's doing and you know i'm sure they are having a whale of a time but it just doesn't come through in the same way as that first album did as a piece of music to be consumed independently, I find it quite lacking at times. And I do switch off a bit. And it kills me to say, because I, even I know I've been hounding for a new album for such a long time. And I give shit to Fall Out Boy on a near weekly basis because I held into the hope of this album one day coming out. And now that it's here... I've just, it's all been for not, well, no, because I was still shit on Fall Out Boy, but I wanted to be able to say, well, I can still say Joe and Andy are still great musicians, but I just, it hasn't done it for me, and I'm very, excuse me, very, very upset. Um, going for this album, because the one thing, the reason one of the reasons why I do the For Fans Off part, especially for like even, like, well, sorry, especially for the like, minor bands or like the non-uber mainstream bands that casual metal fans or rock fans might be aware of is because um, reviews like this and on websites and on podcasts and actual professionals who do this, they'll shit on an album or love an album, but they won't give context to what it is, especially if it's a new act. Um, like, I've not been happy about uh, high crimes but I'd say if you're a fan of He Is Legend if you're a fan of Maylene and Sons of Disaster or if you're a fan of Puppy still give it a go anyways because it's quite easy that although I haven't been a fan of the album if you are th a fan of those three bands or any of those three bands there might be a good chance that you will still go for this album anyways so Puppy, Maylene and Sons of Disaster and he is legend. Go for any of them. Go for High Crimes. It's the second album from the supergroup, The Damn Things. Coolio. So, them's the the standard expected albums of the week or Fortnite. Uh, let's go on to the open mic album for this week, and we are similar to what we did with Billie Eilish. We are staying within the realms of a not alternative music hub, if you will. 
Um, it is the debut hip hop trap album thing from Washington DC based uh, performer Ali Reza. The album is called Endless. It came out uh, a couple of weeks ago now. And the reason why I picked this up, um, as much as I do want to try and get into more uh, commercial and mainstream musical genres, this is, well, Ali Reza is the first hip hop signing to extreme metal label Earache Records. And to put it in perspective, Earache in the past have had the likes of, or their alumni include Napalm Death and Carcass and Oceano. Currently, they have Evil, they've got Lord Mower Death, they've got Worm Rot, um, and Hell Follows With, and Cerebral Boar. Like, they are... Th Ali Reza does not fit that scope in the slightest. Like, let's face it, it's a hip-hop artist on a very metal label. Um, but, in interviews, because, as with everything, because metal fans can be quite close-minded... Ali Reza has done a bunch of interviews in the run-up and he has talked about how he's been a lifelong metal fan in interviews and says that his old band, Loud and Quiet, drew inspiration from black metal, melodic death metal and modern post-hardcore to the point where he is now subsequently trying to bleed these genres into this hip-hop project under the genre heading of Dark Trap. Um, I am not au fait with hip-hop or trap music at all. So I must admit those metal influences outside of the song Vendetta weren't obvious, weren't too obvious. Uh, but you can tell there is like an overall dark mood to the album. Again, I don't know if that's just like very indicative of trap music, but pretty much what I'm saying, take this review with a grain of salt. The album opener of Intervene opens proceedings with an ominous, 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 an ominous, clash of uh brass and like low end string in, um, string instruments and musically say it's like it's predominantly low tone for that the entire album uh the it's very bass heavy mixed with those trap clicks even the more recognizable uh trap songs like all that and halloween there's that really powerful bass line that just rumbles all along the song, which just, like I said, just gives this like dark, low end kind of feel to everything. And a lot of the like uh, rudiness and darkness comes from the vocals. He sounds so fucking confident, which I know is like a quite a weird thing to say for like a professional musician. But when he's in like a full on rap bridge, like on Never Seen, he sounds so focused and. When you think of the label he's on and the background he's had, and by that I mean like Louder Than Quiet would never have gotten to Earache. Like, I've listened to a bit of them. They would never have got there. I'm sorry to say. Sorry, Ali, if you ever listen to this. With all that in mind, you'd never guess that there is a mass of like just deluded people who want him to fail. Like, I saw the comment section when Earache announced the fact that um, Ali Reza had, been, had signed to him. And my fucking god it was bad it was just dumb people are dumb i hate people um and with all that going on you you, you just wouldn't know he sounds so tight and fucking he knows exactly what he needs to be and like the kind of music he is now a part of the r&b breaks in halloween i guess you can kind of compare them to like the melodic vocal breaks in say metalcore or deathcore he sounds perfectly natural in the moment. Uh, throughout the album, particularly on the song Doomed, there is the part where either Ali or a backing singer breaks into almost like a hardcore yelp. Um, and it adds that like suspenseful drama to, like I said, an otherwise quite dark, broody kind of album anyways. Um, the other like rock metal influences on the band, the go-to song for anything like that, like I said before, is Vendetta. Uh, it's got a huge, huge chorus, um, a very discordant guitar riff in the background, and when that song initially came out, I think it came out the same sort of time that it was announced that he was signed to Earache, I read that for the song he was very much inspired by Die Art's Murder, 
and to an extent having that comparison I personally can see it I don't know if I would have got it without him saying Thy Art had an influence but well I can guarantee you, I wouldn't have heard it if he hadn't said Thy Art was an influence um, Thy Art commonly give CJ they have CJ sing a line with the instruments around him just broken down so it's him but it leaves enough musical resonance that he's not an isolated vocal but it's toned down enough that he is still the center point and he's the only one actively doing something if that makes sense the other everyone else like holding a note he is the ones like actively performing um everything else for my ears my untrained to rap hip-hop trap is it's it's more of a feel than a specific hook or a specific melody um, I even think the lyrics are more in keeping with trap than metal. Um, I won't read them out because I will sound white as fuck. Um, and again, it might be that I'm unconditioned to this kind of music, but I did find it got quite samey at times. Um, Vendetta sticks out because of that subtle riff that gives it identity. It is... It just sets it apart from the album, as does the like brass part on intervene there are parts on the rest of the album that does try to replicate this uh never seen has a vocal sample that repeats all that has an even subtler guitar riff but a lot of that stuff does just fall into the bass and becomes quite repetitive and for people who like for my first trap album you might struggle a, a bit i think it'll be more a case of i think at metal fans will go for vendetta it is a very very strong song um but i think similar to me they might fade out just just a bit um i think it's an interesting listen given its context and given what he where he is and what he's now a part of and the one thing i am super intrigued for is to find out what this leads to in terms of other labels Maybe like hip hop labels signing metal bands or more metal labels signing hip hop and dubstep and various electronic acts. Basically just like labels branching out of their own usual talent pools to get new and different ideas and different artists on their labels and produce music for them. I'm also really intrigued to find out what collaborations may or may not come of this, whether it's label mates, uh, like any of those ones I said before, or... Like from Ali Reza, there was like a articles linking to various trap artists who have their metal influences, and there's a lot more than I gave credit to. There's I can't remember any of the names, and I do apologize, but there are a lot that use like screamed vocals. There are a couple that use as he's using screamed vocals. It is more like a black metal tremolo pick at the same time. So that crossover between trap and actual metal, not just trap metal because that shit, but that line it's not being crossed but it is coming together between like artists of other genres coming together and trying to make something a bit different and yeah i'm all about that because as long as they make it interesting it's not just new metal 2.0 and anyone who's ever been onto youtube and it's like um you've got basically like the old days of the popco popco or not even old days the mid days of the popco's punk albums where you get like a hip-hop song and it's got this really flat boring like screamo cover that are all over youtube they often suck and i hope it doesn't get to that sort of point because what issues did back in day back in day combining r&b with um metalcore that was something different because it was combining the two things not just doing one genre with the instrumentation of another which is what a lot of like metal covers or screamo covers do um so yeah i'm very intrigued uh i hope it works out well because like i said i would it's always satisfying to see people who want you want you to fail are the ones that i've got to say watch you ascend to heights they could never get to so all the best of luck to Ali reza similar to what i did with billy eilish i've tried to find metal acts and rock acts that would would make that crossover a little bit easier for people who want to go into Ali reza and I've picked out Chelsea Wolf because she does have that. Well, she's a very big 
doomy kind of sound to a Oathbreaker because it does break between the very isolated post rock kind of stuff to the big shouty parts where the black metal comes through and then the mix of the two together. And being as an ocean as well, similar sort of things, but obviously less more refined and more within the hardcore hemisphere. So, and that latest album has a lot more of the low end, more ambient parts as well, which I think cross over well for Endless. So Chelsea Walls, Oathbreaker, Being As An Ocean. If you are a metal fan and want to give this a go, look for them or consider yourself a fan of them. Maybe go for this. It is called Endless. It is his debut album from Ali Reza, hailing from Washington, D.C. And it's a blend of, or it's a heavy metal and death metal inspired version of trap music. The way he's labeling dark trap. And that will be everything for this week. Uh, next week, we're going... We're going... I was going to say underground, but that's not quite right. We're going for like the, we're going for the little guys. We're going for the underdogs. Uh, so I'll be looking at Bat, which is a blackened punk and roll thing. And their album, a Ecstasy. Fractor, which is a German alt-rock tinged... Uh, punk rock band band called i'm hoping to try and get a band called potence potence i'm not going to try and do that album title because it's french and i don't have it written down and if memory serves that is a very hardcore post hardcore which sounds daft but that's what i can do at the moment um they're not on spotify so i've got to try to remember that they are on my Bandcamp app but those are the three main ones bat fracture and potence uh, the album club will be a big name, so I'm not going to tell you it, just in case I can't get to it. But I'm going to I'm going to keep it a secret, be vague as shit. Um, so that's all coming up next week. Feel free to go find me on the various social medias at Desolation Pod. And I think I've run out of things to say. So hope y'all have a lovely week. I will see you sometime in the next. And yeah, bye. <laughs>